And without further ado, our, our speaker for today is Julio, and he comes to us from Sound Systems Biology, and he's going to be presenting to us on a topic that I did my PhD studies in. So, pseudomonas aeropinosa. There you go. Let me just switch you over. Thank you for inviting me to talk to you about uh, my research on how prebiotic selection drives diversity uh, of pseudomonas originals in the cystic fibrosis zone. So first about uh, cystic fibrosis. Um, cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease that causes improper ion transport across mucosal membranes in multiple organs. Um, in the lung, for example, proper ion transport allows the mucus to be thin and wet that can be pushed to the upper respiratory airways and then expectorated. On the other hand, in a cystic fibrosis afflicted lung, the improper ion transport makes the mucus to become thick and dense, which is difficult to be removed. This then becomes a very good environment for bacteria to proliferate and cause infection due to the immune response of the host. Right? So, so there is a growing awareness that the polymicrobial makeup of the cystic fibrosis lung is dynamic and complex. As we can see here, the relative prevalence of bacteria and fungi across uh, disease progression changes quite dramatically. For instance, Pseudomonas originosa uh, is not uh, very prevalent amongst uh, pediatric patients, but amongst adult patients, it becomes the most prevalent bacteria. Nonetheless, the cystic fibrosis microbiome is still poorly understood. In terms of the disease progression, upon diagnosis and initial infection, this disease is characterized by periodic episodes of uh, acute pulmonary infections that are called exacerbations. Now, after, while there is an improvement after each one of these um, episodes, there's an overall decline in patient condition that eventually leads to death. Antibiotics have helped uh, increase the survivability to this disease, but the treatments are still not working consistently. So there is a need to improve these treatments, and we're trying to do that by better understanding the clinical impact of the cystic fibrosis microbiome. Um, for this purpose, a team of scientists from the University of Toronto and funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, led by Dr. David Gunman, my supervisor, and Dr. David Wong, have started assessing the breadth and depth of uh, cystic fibrosis-associated polymicrobial respiratory tract infections. So we are aiming to track and assess the changes of the cystic fibrosis microbiome as a function of disease progression and disease severity, with their overarching goal of improving and identifying new targeted treatments. We're looking not only at my, a bacteria in the microbiome, fungi in the microbiome, and uh, transcriptional levels in the metatranscriptome, but we're also taking a look at the fine scale population dynamics of the most relevant bacteria in the cystic fibrosis microbiome. And, and that's where I'm mostly interested, that's where my research lies. Um, I'm interested in characterizing the fine scale genomic diversity of Pseudomonas aeruginosa in the uh, lungs of adult uh, patients. So for, for this purpose, in order to get a glimpse as to how this sort of longitudinal analysis can allow us to elucidate the dynamics of Pseudomonas aeruginosa in the lung, I have been working on a patient CF67 who was a 34-year-old female who, uh, um, at, the, at the time of the study, and whose sputum culture revealed that the most prevalent bacteria in the lung was uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Our collaborators from a local cystic fibrosis clinic collected 12 sputum samples uh, across, uh, across the span of a year from November 2010 to November 2011. Uh, we also have other clinical information such as antibiotics. As we can see there, every row represents an antibiotic that was given to the patient and the black uh, bars are when the patient was actually uh, taking that medicine. Another member of our, of our lab, uh, Sean Clark, um, grew Pseudomonas aeruginosa colonies from each of these sputum samples. Uh, and he isolated approximately 20 colonies per sputum sample so that it reflected the morphological diversity of Pseudomonas uh, aeruginosa in each of these samples for a total of 235 isolates. All right, so, Upon DNA extraction, and um, we sequence the whole genome of each of these isolates, 
and using the uh, next generation sequencing Illumina with paired end sequencing. So given that we needed uh, a lot of data to be produced, we did that through a number of sequencing runs with variant sequencing read lengths. So this could be a hotspot for results that are biased by coverage depth, by sequencing quality, and perhaps even read length. So in, in, over, uh, in order to uh, overcome these potential uh, biases, I designed a, a, a pipeline that uses the best de novo assemb uh, assembled isolate from our collection. Then we map the reads of all our isolates back to that reference using three algorithmically different methods. In this case, I use BWA that uses the Boris Wheeler transform, uh, uh, I use a Bayesian suffix array uh, approach that's used by LAST and dynamic programming, which, uh, which is provided by NovoLine. So the polymorphisms that were produced by this pipeline needed to be corroborated by these three algorithms. This, uh, the result of, the, uh, of, of passaging these 235 complete genomes through this pipeline yielded 108 single nucleotide polymorphism. 58 of them were parsimonious informative, meaning that they were observed in more than one isolate. 41 of them were segregating in two or more sampling time points. And in terms of the functional classification, approximately 65% of them were non synonymous mutations, 23.1% did not cause a change in the amino acid sequence, and the remaining 8% were found in non-coding uh, regions of the genome. So I used this um, 108 uh, SNPs to recreate the phylogeny of these isolates. And uh, I use a neighbor joining method to create this tree. And what we can see here is that there are two main, two main plates. The one at the top, which seems to have more isolates and shorter branch lengths. The one at the bottom with less isolates but longer branch lengths. Now, a branch length is, is a process to let us see how much variation has been accumulated by each of the isolates. So this observation allows to see that while the clay at the bottom has accumulated Many, uh, many changes, the clade at the top has seemed to have swept all that variation. All right, so I'm gonna look into, uh, uh, into more detail at this, and perhaps a more uh, appropriate way to look at this is to use a network-based analysis. In this case, this is a neighbor net phylogenetic analysis, and the way to look at this is, uh, first of all, the, the, the circle over there is, represents when the isolates were collected that are at the nodes, so the bright yellow would be isolates collected in the first sampling time point, going all the way to the blue, which are the last isolates uh, collected in our, uh, in our collection. Right? So, so the advantage of this tree is that the nodes are not forced to bifurcate into two branches, right? So the reticulation are a, a strong signal for potential recombination events. And again, in this tree, we see two, two populations, right? The blue one with long branches with more reticulation, and we see another one, the red one, which uh, whose phylogeny represents, it resembles kind of the one of a star phylogeny, one that has swept the variation perhaps due through a, through a, through a, through a recent expansion. All right, so the fact that we are seeing more variation in one clade and the other clade resembles more of a star phylogeny, perhaps product of a selective uh, uh, bottleneck, we're starting, we started calling this our ancestral clade and our sweep clade, sweeping clade because it swept the variation. All right, so other signals for the fact, uh, for, for us calling one of these clades essential and sweep is that even though most of our isolates are in our sweep clade, most of, our, most of the variation that we see in all our samples are observed in their ancestral clade. So the number of SNPs in our ancestral clade is more than double that one of the sweep population. And when we look at the average number of nucleotide differences between isolates in the ancestral clade, it's double that of the sweep clade. Not only that, but when we compare the, uh, the ratio of non-synonymous to synonymous mutations, we can see that the sweep population seems to have a signal for positive selection. So again, we're seeing a, a, a signal that the population is just coming from a bottleneck, from a selective bottleneck. Um, so I use this 108 SNPs also to uh, recreate the past of these isolates using Bayesian approaches in order to find a better coalescent model uh, that could fit our data. So this is first the Bayesian skyline plot that shows us the relative population size of our population as a function of time. So the way to read this is the population size is on the y-axis and the time is on the x-axis going from the past at the, at, the, at the right going to the present to the left. 
So uh, the way we can describe our how our population size was changing is that up to 300 days previous to the last sampling time point, the size was constant. Then there was a decline in our population size, followed by a rapid expansion, and then constant size again. We use this same Bayesian approach to estimate the time to the most recent common ancestor. And the sweet clay had a common ancestor that matches the starting, more or less the starting of the decline of our population. So we can start to speculate and say that perhaps the, 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 the arrival of this sweeping clay was a response to an environmental change that was causing the whole population to shrink. And in response to that, the, the, this is a, an avenue that the population took to overcome and increase its survival on the lungs. So to complete the picture in terms of the time to the most recent common ancestor, Using the same method, we uh, estimated that our 235 isolates coalesced to an ancestor that, that happened approximately 3.1 years uh, previous to the last sampling time point. Our ancestral clay uh, had an, a common ancestor that arrived shortly thereafter, and two years later came the ancestor of the sweeping clay. So, as we can see here, the dominant uh, clay in the past was the ancestral clay, but something happened at around 300 days that allowed the expansion of the sweeping clay. Right? So we uh, rooted this to uh, with a with a known complete genome uh, uh, closely related to this, just to get the, the dates right. Uh, so so what I hope that I've shown you is that that we have witnessed uh, a population that was dominated by, by, one, by one group, but then due to a selective pressure, another, an, another plate came to uh, arrive through favorable mutations. And now we expect that we are seeing only a one year time frame, but we are uh, proposing that this perhaps is an event that's happening uh, uh, with, mo uh, with more periodicity. So we're uh, proposing that there's a periodic selection what drives uh, to the monastery journals of diversity. And with that, thank you very much. Um, to my left. Is it time for a question, Jimmy? Sorry, it's antibiotics. Don't so this last pressure change to help you pass that out to that, That's a good question. Um, the antibiotics are just one of the uh, of the factors that act. Other other factors could be their own immune system, how it changes. I mean, the, in terms of putting a date to how an antibiotic may change uh, or, or may have an effect on the population, it's difficult because once you take the, 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 the antibiotic, we don't know really how effective is it in reaching the actual hotspot of the infection. Yes, yeah, so there, there are genes or regions in the genome that have an even higher ENDS. I'm amazed that so, you know, it's more than two genome wide. There, there are the, you know, where's the positive selection acting? So, the most of the mutations that we find, they are in very interesting genes. Uh, we found these genes to be in virulence associated uh, uh, genes, uh, in uh, you know, in, in genes that are related to the mechanisms for the gene survival. But in terms of the distribution of non-synonymous and synonymous mutation, they happen evenly in these really interesting genes that I would come into more detail about.